I have to disagree that I stay on the side of the body. <laughs> and uh, because, of course, I'm an OBGYN, and so I should study the body of women. But the four bullet points I put on my agenda, you will see, they try to put together the body and mind of women. Because we need to avoid the monocular vision, otherwise we fail. And this is the reason why, really, we still don't have a drug to treat female sexual dysfunction. So I will go through out my four items on the agenda. First concept, the unique nature of the intrinsic and extrinsic factors influencing women's sexuality across the lifespan, so during the different period of a woman's life, limits our ability to discriminate between biological organic components and psychological and contextual determinants of the sexual response and behavior, of course, and to find effective pharmacotherapy for sexual symptoms. So it's uh, extremely difficult to translate that beautiful data that Jim showed us this morning into the real problem of women in the daily life. Second, as a reproductive endocrinologist, I know for sure that the hormonal milieu is the major driver of women's sexual functioning. As we know very well, many reproductive milestones, such as menarche, pregnancy, menopause, and other endocrine manipulations, such as hormonal contraception, hormonal chemotherapies, other hormonal therapies, they are associated with significant variation of the sexual response at multiple levels, not only at the level of the genitals, as you can say, but also at the level of the central nervous system, hypothalamus, limbic, and cortical system. And this is mind, but this is body as well. But we know also, according to what Johannes uh, uh, so brilliantly explained to us, that we need a, a multidisciplinary approach. So the inter-individual differences and intra-individual changes in sexual function and behavior are variable, unpredictable, and as Pedro explained to us, the use of objective measures to measure uh, really the sexual response in terms of genitals of women does not reflect at all what happened in the mind of women. And therefore, it's mandatory to expand the field of research in female sexual dysfunction. And we have to take into account the biopsychosocial model Johannes was alluding to, because we have to keep on going, of course, to study the biological, the anatomy, the physiology of female sexual response. But on the same time, we really need to uh, investigate more in clinical practice intrapersonal and interpersonal clues to really understand the sexual medicine world and not just the OBGYN perspective or the endocrinological perspective and so on. And this is a difficult task to do in the office because we know in daily practice that the problem of addressing women's sexual symptoms is really vast, distressful. You see here. These are American data, but we can show also data from, from Europe. We have more or less one out of 10 women suffering of any kind of sexual dysfunction. We have a peak, and we will see around the time of menopause. But when you address something in the office, then you have to offer solution to your patient. And unfortunately, as you know very well, female sexual dysfunction is still an unmet clinical condition because they are not specific. There are many drugs under investigation because we are not able to balance benefit and risk of a drug that is really effective for women of any age. And we focus mostly on menopause, but we know that there are women of many age out there suffering. So in order to put together the body and mind, we need to consider all the different dimensions of sexuality in real life. And we have to focus, of course, of individual disposition, what we name genes. Then we have the body. The body as gynecologist, we work with the vagina, with the vulva, with the clitoris every day. But this is not sexuality. Sexuality, we have learned, is still also in the brain of women is modulated by hormones, and we have all those other factors, that so-called psychosocial network of factors, body image, the partner, the, the work you do, and also the environment where you live. And this is my little cartoon summarizing what I have learned over 25 years of what happened in terms of neuroendocrinology in the female brain, in the women brain. Of course, we take 
all the study from the animal model to summarize in one sentence that for sure sex hormone primed the brain, and we know from Jim, he <laughs> is one of the major scientists in this field, to be selectively responsive to sexual incentives, and we create a neurochemical state more likely inducing sexual response. We have all the, the actors on the stage, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, <coughs> they interact with all the nuclei and the brain areas, and you have to think about that every day a woman, she is, uh, as you know, uh, we are not uh, fixed every day in our menstrual cycle, every day is different. So we have the follicular phase, the ovulatory phase, the luteal phase, the menstrual phase, then we have pregnancy, which we have huge amount of estrogen and testosterone, and then we have menopause, in which we uh, don't have mostly estrogen, we have little androgen, we don't have progesterone. So major change across the reproductive lifespan of women. So we may impact on desire, we mental arousal, orgasm, satisfaction at the level of the central nervous system, interacting with almost all the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators that we know uh, and we are aware of. But of course, as gynecologists, we work every day with the genital organs. As I said, not only the vulva and the vagina, most gynecologists there believe that it's only the vagina, it's only the vulva, we know very well that it's much more than that, it's also the uterus, it's also the perineum, it's also the urethroclitoral complex. On this tissue, as you know very well, this tissue, they express massive amount of receptors, and these receptors for hormones, they change according to the reproductive lifespan of women. Sex hormone, of course, what they do on the genital tissue, they mostly exert a trophic effect, and they modulate the threshold of tissue response to those external and internal stimuli, depending on the environment, on the partner, and so on, throughout a neurochemical array. And what is, has been exciting during these last 20 years is to discover that the same mediators that you know very well for erectile dysfunction, you have studied so much the nitric oxide pathways, the prostaglandin, we have also other modulators such as the VIP, MPY, and so on, but also the same balance of neurotransmitters that is within the central nervous system is acting at the peripheral level under the modulation of hormones to modulate sensation, vasocongestion, lubrication, orgasm, and so on. So we really need to put together, this is my little cartoon to, to show the idea that, of course, we need to study the genitals. Of course, we need to try to restore the environment of the vagina, of the vulva, in terms of ability to respond. But if we look, as I told you at the beginning, only in a monocular uh, way, this uh, complicated picture that so uh, well Pedro explained to us how many things connect the mental arousal and the genital arousal and how is special this kind of connection, we will fail. We will fail to solve really a sexual problem of our patient. Maybe we can treat lubrication, but we will not improve the entire sexual response that is so uh, finely modulated by so many factors. What we know about uh, the relationship between genetic and epigenetic in uh, women's uh, uh, sexual health, I believe Andrea Barry is the one that has studied most uh, this field. Of course, uh, as you know very well, this field of research, and in particular pharmacogenomics, is still in its infancy in terms of female sexual uh, function and dysfunction, but he was able to revise the literature and saying that Mostly, genetic uh, um, accounts for 30% of what we are in terms of um, uh, organization of neurotransmitters, uh, organization of uh, hormonal receptors and metabolism and so on, and environmental factors accounts for more or less 70%. So we really learn from a genetic study the importance of environmental factors and interaction of gene and environment in disease development and maintenance in women. But as Pedro showed very uh, clearly, uh, that during, over the years, we had many models to interpret women's sexual response. And we thought, uh, as usual, you know, when something comes before and something comes after, 
usually we believe that what comes after is better than what uh, comes before. But we are not sure about this, because if you think about uh, Munster and Johnson, they focus on the genital response of women. Ellen Kaplan, of course, she was a psychiatrist. She focused on the engine of the sexual response that is desire, something in the brain, what we name now desire and arousal and mental arousal. And then we face, during the last 15 years, the Basson model, in which she claimed that that intimacy for women is much more important than the genital and mental arousal. But going on studying this field, we realize that maybe they are women, they are different uh, in terms of endorsing a model uh, that is more genital oriented or mental oriented or relationship oriented. And maybe it's also possible that during different period of your life, let's say when you're young, you can endorse a model in which the physical response is much more important, or when you're old, you may endorse an, uh, a model in which intimacy is more important, or is true the other way around, according to your experience. And indeed, a couple of friends of us, Michael Sand and Bob Fisher, they published this simple study in Journal of Sexual Medicine several years ago, and they, what they did, something very simple, they used the, the female sexual function index score, the cutoff score, we can discuss that this doesn't mean nothing to have a score, but in research, in medical research, we need to start from some objective data, and what he tried, they tried to demonstrate that women may endorse different models. They can behave according to the Master and Johnson, the Kaplan, the Basson, and there are many women that we still don't understand how they work really in sexual function and dysfunction. And uh, you can see from the color of the bars that uh, it's interesting to observe that dysfunctional women uh, they are the one endorsing more the model in which intimacy and so the relationship is so important. Why? Functional women, they endorse more model in which the biological basis, the organic basis of sexuality, they are so important. And it's a pleasure for me to, to also mention the work of another Canadian, brilliant Canadian, that is Cindy Meston, uh, that she was able indeed uh, to develop a very simple instrument that we can use in clinical practice that is a questionnaire that is able to investigate very simply the cues resulting in desire for sexual activity in women. Why I'm mentioning this questionnaire? Because when we have a woman, let's say uh, a woman that she is young and we are prescribing a hormonal contraception to, to this woman she can develop low desire as a consequence of this hormonal contraception. But we need to understand which one are the, the basis of the desire for that woman. Why I'm saying that? Because if your cues for sexual desire are more biologically driven, let's say to see a naked, a uh, good-looking male, or maybe having a, a, a fantasy that is focused on genital response, I can be more sensitive to a normal manipulation in comparison to a woman that she is initiating sex because it's so nice, he's bringing her to a nightlight candle dinner in Paris or he's buying uh, Louis Vuitton bags or so on. We can do many more examples. So if we do not understand which one are the cues women are using, we cannot really study in practice this issue. This is just a joke, just to mention another very good friend of mine working in the field of, of female sexual medicine, that is Cheryl Kinsberg, that she really focused on the problem we had all, also in uh, sexual medicine as from a medical perspective. At the beginning, we mirror what happened in men, physical and mental response, and how to study drugs with the medical model that was developed on the genital response of men. But she always say that it's different, the sex for men and women. Because for women, of course, intimacy means something that allows you to have sexual activity. Why? For men, it's different. So it's very important when we want to understand the sexual behavior 
also to take into account intimacy, even though maybe uh, we believe that is just something organic. And indeed, just to mention another very uh, important scientist that has worked a lot also for gynecologists because uh, uh, John Bancroft together with uh, Cynthia Graham, they try to understand the side effects of hormones in terms of sexual function and behavior and to try to figure out why we are not able to really demonstrate that a pe peculiar hormonal manipulation is able to modify uh, women's sexuality as a whole, they really said in, in uh, human wars what James said in animal wars, that for women, desire of, uh, of course is related to reproduction, sexuality is related to reproduction, but for women, pleasure is something that is a super added value that depends not only from the physical response, but for their power in terms of femininity. And this is the reason why body image is so important for women, because for women, the power of desire is not to desire usually somebody, of course it can happen, but it's most common that women, they feel powerful in terms of sexuality because men desire them, because they want to be emotionally intimate with that particular man, but also they want to be in control. And this is the reason why when women, they fear the partner and they have an anxiety response, a behavior that block them, they can block lubrication, even though the genital apparatus is completely healthy. And so we have many differences among, among men and women that they are so difficult to study. And just to convince you that we need to put uh, uh, biology and psychology and relationship together, I took this wonderful book, I'm sure that Jim knows this, I was doing my PhD and postdoctoral fellowship in, in Canada at that time, and I went in a library and I read this wonderful book at that time, The Alchemy of Love and Lust. And if you look at all the different actors that we may measure uh, in the blood, uh, we can test in the brain, maybe during a neuroendocrinological testing or a behavioral testing or whatever you want. So all the actors and many of these actors we have already mentioned this morning, of course, uh, I will go faster throughout this, but you see that a hormone or a neuropeptide can have a relationship meaning can have an emotional meaning. So the, 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 the biological basis of sexuality, they are strongly related to behavior, such as, think about prolactin, inhibit sex drive, of course, because when you lactate, it's not a good thing in nature that you engage in sexual activity, but also if you take uh, selective uh, uh, serotonin receptor modulators, you can increase prolactin because you are depressed, and so it's a vicious circus between uh, body and mind. And also, when we think about uh, uh, the, the reproductive lifespan, we really need to think about all those chemicals in the context of evolution of women throughout life. This is a complicated cartoon for your discussion, I want to show you because in this I see my role as a gynecologist in the office dealing with these uh, symptoms in women. Of course, when I have a, an adolescent woman in which her hormones, they are so important because you ovulate, you have a lot of testosterone when you are young, because you are in love every day mostly. And of course, there are some, uh, um, some neurochemicals, they are much more important. You feel attraction, it's a novel stimulus. You are in your relationship. And so when I prescribe any kind of, a, of hormones or when a woman she has a diagnosis let's say an infection, uh, something, um, a scars in the genitals or whatever it is, the impact is completely different in comparison to a woman that entered her other life that she was pregnant and she had major change, not only in her body, but also in the significance of the relationship. Let's say when you do a baby with somebody, you affiliate with that person, you develop affection, but as you know very well, you enter a routine, you change your role, and so on. And so at this point, I should consider all these things. And I was particularly pleased to see the data and, and uh, Johannes show that women usually 
decline their sexual activity after their 30s. Why? Because they put other priorities. And so he, I have to consider that. And this is the reason why also women, of course, revitalize their sexuality when they have a younger partner. Think about women and menopause. Of course, as Johanna said, you desexualize, you have over-familiarity when you get older, you have other chemicals that become important because you develop attachment, commitment, long-lasting relationship, the sense of being together. And so it's completely different when you treat a woman that she is 50 in a stable, long-lasting relationship in comparison to a woman that she is with a new partner and so on. Another point that we have in the office, it's really, and Pedro said very well this, and this is probably the reason why I'm so sorry they are not OBGYN in this uh, room, apart uh, a few of my group, because the same patient we see in our office, they are not the one they go into sexual medicine expert. Why this? Because you should perceive the distress. Distress is a very important criteria. Why? Because you can have a sexual symptom, let's say you have low lubrication, no orgasm with your partner, you can discuss with your doctor, you, you understand that it's a problem, and if you really feel that this is a distressing problem, in that time, at that time it becomes a dysfunction. And so the woman, I, I, think, I think always about uh, women, sorry about that, but it can, uh, it's the same for men, uh, she said, okay, I have a dysfunction, I should go to see somebody to solve and fix this issue. But there are many people that they accept this problem after talking or they believe that it's not important. They also adjust to symptoms so they don't want to be treated or they start a treatment and then they don't go on. And this, it's dependent on many factors that, again, they are in the lifespan of the woman not only the age, but also the stage of her life, and also for women, it's important also the partner. So we really have to think when we deal with female sexual health that we need to uh, think in, a, the, in the couple perspective, because only doing that, only working together with male experts of male sexual dysfunction, we can, uh, we can really achieve this. And how much is important to determine the distress uh, as you know, the, the, the DSM-5 changed the definition, but what I want to focus your attention is here, that the new criteria for defining a woman with a female sexual dysfunction is having a huge amount of distress. You see, 75, 10, 100% when you have a diagnosis. Why? Because sometimes it's just sexual dissatisfaction, it's just a moment in life. And of course, this is the reason why it's so difficult to treat these women. And also, we need to have a long duration of a disorder, it's not just uh, three, uh, three minutes. And as already Ioanne said, there are something is very important for women. The turning point, the only biological turning point that we were able to study, because it's a clear-cut condition, you have a decline of Estradiol. This is the only clear-cut condition hormonal, uh, related of women. Menopause, okay? And you see that in the data from Jan Schifrin in North America, what they found, they found that the three major uh, domain of uh, uh, sexual disorders associated with distress are influenced by menopause. You see the, the number, they are not so strong. Uh, natural menopause, surgical menopause, and by the general physical and mental health, as Johanna said. So many medical conditions we should take into account to understand, to encode all the, the, the biological dimension that may have during the aging process. But you see how is important this uh, subset analysis that uh, Ray Rosen did is that when you split, not by disorders, but by having or not having a partner, the distress of a female sexual uh, dysfunction becomes extremely strong. It's a, a odd ratio of 4.63, and meaning that the partner should be considered. 
which one are the major medical conditions that have uh, a big impact on women's sexual health. It's interesting to observe that the most common condition that you know very well, they are underlying erectile dysfunction, such as, for example, heart uh, disease or diabetes or uh, other, uh, let's say, cardiovascular disorder. In this study, at least, they didn't seem so important. But what was important was the physical substrate of the genitals response, that is a very easy symptom that women they can describe that is urinary incontinence, that can occur during the aging process, as you know, as a consequence of age and menopause and delivery, and mood disorder, depression and anxiety. Only a little bit of thyroid problems, endocrinologists know this very well, and not so much more. The condition that we can treat in the office that is so important in terms of biology is uh, the definition. You, we have a new definition of this condition that is associated with menopause. It's not vaginal atrophy as we know in the past, but it's a new name we gave to this condition that is genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It's a new dermatology to define the collection of sinus symptoms associated with, as I told you, a clear cut condition that is estrogen deprivation. Which one are all these symptoms? You see, the, the authors, of course, they put together physical symptoms and peripheral sexual symptoms such as dryness and sexual pain. You see also with decreased arousal, orgasm and desire, what is? Because if a woman, she has always pain in her genital, sooner or later she can develop also a mental disorder in terms of desire and arousal. So meaning that the circle of the sexual response may be impaired. But maybe it's not true, the vice versa. There are women, they have a perfect mental arousal, but unfortunately they do not respond, not because of EVA, but because of other, of other conditions. Then we try to find another endocrine condition during the menopause that we name androgen insufficiency. You know very well you have the androgen insufficiency in male, but what happened in male? That you were able to find a cutoff, a plasma level cutoff. We know in, in real life, in the office, that we don't have a plasma cutoff of testosterone for women. We have just women presenting in the office with this kind of symptoms, reduced sex motivation, sexual fantasy, I don't feel pleasure, I feel less arousal, I feel less genital uh, vasocongestion. I have many symptoms of menopause extremely severe, and we believe that this condition is associated to androgen decline. Why we believe, but we're not sure? Because until now, we were not able to demonstrate that any kind of hormones into the circulation, I have two minutes, into the circulation is able to correlate to any domain of uh, sexual function or mood change and so on. What we know for sure that androgens, any kind of androgens, both the androgens they are produced by the ovary mostly, such as androsenedione or even testosterone, and the androgens they are produced mostly by the adrenals, such as the HEA and the HES, decline with age. And think about they are very high when we are young, when, we, when sexual function and behavior, they are so important for reproduction. And then when the follicle become older, they are not produced into the follicle anymore because, because you don't need ovulation, you don't need reproduction, and so on. And also the adrenal function aged. Last point I want to make is the cup. Oh, see. Uh, the last point I want to make is the one that already Johannes uh, uh, made, is the couple that is relevant. This is another wonderful uh, and uh, cartoon and funny cartoon by Cheryl that she was so kind to offer me this concept that is second law of Newton. Like a sexualized version of this law, the sexual equilibrium implies that any change in one partner will produce a change in the other. And just to give you an example, Look at this wonderful study by Lorraine Dennerstein, another friend in Australia, that she devoted the entire life to understand the complication of studying women's sexuality in the context of hormones. You, you have this condition, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, you have a lot of desire for your partner, you don't have desire. But when you have this, 
because you have a challenge. You had the surgical menopause, so you shut down the 50% of your androgenic production. But you see that when you have this condition, you also are used not to interact with your partner anymore. Why? When you have a bit more desire, even though you, uh, you were overectomized, you go on interacting with your partner. So meaning that you change your behavior also. And if you do not interact with your partner, of course, how you can have all that sexual incentives? And it's also true the other way around. We have uh, uh, Mario Maggi here. You know very well that if you don't study also male sexuality, you know, women, of course, men, women, they ma can masturbate, they can have a, a, a lesbian orientation. But if you are in an heterosexual couple, the most important information that as OBGYN we should have is about the, uh, the, the, the medical part of the male sexual function. And we know from many, many studies, I just select this one because of probably was one of the first in which we clearly show, it was clearly shown that if you improve the erectile dysfunction of male, you may improve the female sexual function of postmenopausal women, even though they are not taking hormones. And so to conclude, uh, I want to conclude with this uh, review article I have uh, uh, recently uh, published with uh, one of my MD uh, students, in which I stress the idea that we have, uh, as doctors, many barriers to discuss sexual health during medical consultation. And of course, it's something that is related to the patient, as already Johannes said, age, education. But also, we have to think about that we have women, they are alone, they are widow, we survive a lot more than male. And, uh, and so sometimes we are alone also because they go with younger partner. I know embarrassment, poor awareness, this is true for the woman, this is true also for the healthcare professional because we don't have in our teaching cares uh, uh, um, something devoted specific to sexual medicine, but also because it's common knowledge and you see this is the most important point then nothing can be done medically. The sexual problems are part of the natural aging process, it's not, it's, and so on. And most importantly, and I'm happy that we are here at San Rafael Hospital that is so important in research for many diseases, but sex is a, a form of disease and should be a priority in, health, in our healthcare system. Not like we believe that it's something for superficial people that think about to develop lifestyle drug and not treating important condition. You see why I'm saying this? Because I would love to, to have a drug in my hands as a doctor to treat women. At, at present, I don't have. What we have out there, as Johannes said, we have hormone therapy, but keep in mind they are only for postmenopausal women and they can improve only the lubrication domain, but they are not well conducted, double blind, uh, a placebo control trial demonstrated they can improve the sexual response as a whole. We had some data on the transdermal use of testosterone is in the surgical model of hypoactive sexual disease disorder. Only few women use this and safety issue stopped the marketing of this patch in Europe. In the US was not even approved by the FDA. Then we have, of course, Local estrogen therapy, the first line strategy to improve the trophism of the genitals. We have now a new SOM, so a drug that is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, or spamifen, that can be used to treat this perunion, was approved by the FDA, but is just focusing on postmenopausal women with this perunion. Then we have some promising data from, uh, from uh, Quebec. Uh, Fernand Labris lab that is developing a precursor of estradiol DHEA for vaginal use, but is still in uh, uh, postmenopausal women. And what we have in our hands for premenopausal women, we developed some uh, drug, but unfortunately they were not able to reach an improvement. Uh, they, uh, Johannes already mentioned about flibanserine that is working. I think Jim is the, is the pop of this field. Uh, then we have bremelanoside. We try also to use all those drugs that you know very well in clinical practice for male alone or in combination with hormones or with antidepressants. And you see we are trying to shift in the paradigm from something that you take every day 
from something that you take on demand just to do sexual activity. But this is a complex paradigm in women because for us probably it's much more important to take something every day instead than to take something on demand. But we still don't know if it, this is true or not. What I want to conclude uh, from my talk is that one of the reasons why there is not FDA approved treatment for female sexual dysfunction, I do not believe because there is a, a gender issue in sexual medicine. I do not really believe that the authorities be, think that sexual function is less important in female than in male. And we have to stop this fighting, carrying a flag of a disease mongering. So if we are doing this meeting, it's because we want to promote drug or that there is a battle of sex. It's just because it's extremely difficult at present moment to balance, in my opinion, uh, really the concept of efficacy, so to improve uh, sexual function over placebo in a meaning, a significant way for women, with the safety of giving a chronic treatment for a non-life-threatening condition in women of any age, even childbearing pot potential. And so the gender gap in sexual medicine has something to do with these things, to try to overprotect uh, uh, over women. And we are in need of a drug, but we have also are in need of tons of love and affection and intimacy. So we really should go together working in a team. And this is the reason why I would love to thank also my young team at the, at the hospital that helped me to work every day with women. And you see that we have a big gender gap in OBGYN now because I have only a male, David, on the right side and so many women, brilliant girls, I hope they can develop more for the field in the future. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>